Questions? Are there any questions? The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Has the Prime Minister now familiarised himself with the Treasurer's comments regarding the housing affordability crisis, which the Treasurer made on 30 July, and about which I asked the Prime Minister on Tuesday? Journalist, uh, do you concede that there is a housing crisis, housing affordability crisis in Australia at the moment? Treasurer, house prices are higher than they have been, and they are higher than they have been because more people are in work and more people are able to afford to borrow to purchase more expensive housing. <coughs> Journalist, so is there a crisis, Treasurer? Order. Answer from the Treasurer, well, no. Does the Prime Minister agree with his Treasurer that there is no housing affordability crisis in Australia? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Um, Mr Speaker, the answer to the Leader of the Opposition is that I have familiarised myself with the Treasurer's statement. I thought it was a very accurate statement the Treasurer made, Mr Speaker. Because what he said was, what the Treasurer said was that you have a crisis when house prices fall. And, uh, well, Order. well, Mr. I mean, Order. I think, the Prime Minister has the call. We are, we are witnessing the beginning. We are witnessing, Mr. Speaker, the beginnings <coughs> of a housing crisis in sections of the United States. And, you know, the, 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 those. Um, who said opposite would be well to treat this issue more seriously than they are, because what is occurring in the United States does have the potential to cast a long shadow around the world. It does have the potential to have unintended consequences on um, credit levels in this country. And I think at a time like this, it behoves everybody to choose their language very carefully. And, uh, it behoves those who sit opposite uh, not to wish for a crisis that, Mr Speaker, um, uh, does not exist. Uh, I, I think, Mr Speaker, a lot of Australians who are wanting to buy their first home are finding it very difficult to do so. And the reason they're finding it difficult to do so is that the cost of buying the first home has risen out of proportion to the increase in their wages. Now, that is the fundamental reason why we've got a problem at the present time. Whereas with most other things that people buy, the cost of them has not risen out of proportion to the rise in incomes. In the case of housing, the cost of buying the first home has risen out of proportion to the increase in incomes. And therefore, in addressing this matter, it's important that we don't aggravate that gap. It's important we don't widen that gap, Mr Speaker and some of the remedies that are simply going to push up further the price of housing are not adequate responses. We need to tackle the supply side, and that is why the Treasurer is focused on having an order to land. We need to look at, we need to look at um, uh, local government the member for uh, development charges. We need the to look for at is state warned. government taxes, Mr Speaker. But the last thing we need uh, is uh, a resort to cheap language which is designed to scare people and to create a situation Mr. Speaker, that is worse than the situation that is facing some young Australians. So I would say to the Leader of the Opposition that a true housing crisis in this country is when there is a sustained fall in the value of our homes and in house prices. Mr. Speaker, and for the Leader of the Opposition to use careless language Mr Speaker, is only aggravating rather than helping the situation. The Honourable Member for Wakefield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Would the Prime Minister inform the House about water availability and contingency planning in the southern Murray-Darling Basin? What does this mean for a truly national approach to managing our water resources? The Honourable Prime Minister. I thank the, uh, the member for Wakefield uh, for his question. And, um, I'm very sorry to inform the House that the fourth Murray-Darling Basin Contingency Planning Report confirms the very parlous state of water in the southern Murray-Darling. Water availability is at seriously low levels and is deteriorating further. Irrigation allocations are still at either zero or extremely low. The inflows into storages are at record low levels. 
and there is significantly less water stored today than was the situation at an equivalent time last year. The horticultural and other water dependent industries, needless to say, are the hardest hit of all. And there is now tragically a high risk of losses of permanent plantings. This contingency planning report, <coughs> which has come from the Nurry Darling Basin Commission, recommends that governments in the basin, states, and of course the federal government, consider additional measures. One of the measures recommended in this latest report is the possibility of a reserve for critical needs. I've sought the agreement of the relevant state premiers, that's the premiers of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and the Chief Minister of the Australian Capital Territory, to a joint statement releasing the report. I'm pleased to say that the Premier of New South Wales, Mr Yemmer, the Premier of South Australia, Mr Rann, and the Chief Minister of the ACT, Mr Stanhope, have all agreed to the release of that report under a joint statement. To date, the Victorian Premier has indicated he's not willing to agree, despite the fact that I gave him assurances on the reserve, including that the officials of the relevant jurisdictions would be fully consulted about the implementation of any recommendations. I would like to appeal to the Victorian Premier. I would like to ask him to adopt the same attitude as been adopted by Mr Yemmer and Mr Rann and Mr Stanhope. This is not a case of a Liberal Prime Minister attacking a Labor State Premier, because on this occasion the Liberal Prime Minister and the Labor Premiers of New South Wales and South Australia and the Labor Chief Minister of the Australian Capital Territory are all singing from the same hymn sheet. This is not an occasion for state parochialism. This is an occasion for total cooperation, and we are dealing here with a genuine crisis. There is a water shortage crisis in the Murray-Darling Basin. Crisis is not an exaggerated word to use in relation to this water situation. And those of my colleagues who represent horticultural districts of Australia, uh, people like um, the Minister for Employment Services, people like the member for the Mallee, the, I could give you a great long list. The member for Riverina and the member for Farrah, they understand the parlous state of people uh, whose livelihoods are derived from the Murray-Darling Basin. So I just, and it's not the, the inappropriate word to use, I plead with the Victorian Premier to take the national approach that has been taken by Mr Yemmer, Mr Rann and Mr Stanhope. And I would like to ask him to reconsider. I'd like to invite him to talk to me, to talk to Mr Yemmer, to Mr Rann and Mr Stanhope, because the situation is far worse than any of us would have hoped a few months ago. We all thought when there was some rain in June that the drought might break and the Murray-Darling might be saved. Tragically, that has not occurred. And the last thing we should have at the moment is any kind of selfish state parochialism. We will solve this only as Australians, and we have to share the pain as Australians and not behave like Victorians or South Australians or Queenslanders or New South Welshmen. It's too important for that, and I would ask the Victorian Premier to reconsider his position. I'm going to release the contingency report immediately so that the Australian people, and most particularly those of our fellow Australians who are most sorely afflicted by this crisis, can make judgments of themselves as to what is required in a cooperative spirit to tackle a very real crisis faced by the food bowl of the nation. The Honourable the Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister and refers also to the water crisis in the Murray-Darling Basin. Does the Prime Minister agree that the Commonwealth has a responsibility to put the national interest first 
and help resolve the issue of the over-allocation of water entitlements in the Murray-Darling Basin? Does the Prime Minister agree that water is over-allocated in the Murray-Darling Basin? Why did the Prime Minister give written approval on 25 March 2007 for the auctioning of 8,000 megalitres of water entitlements for the Warrigo River. Does the Prime Minister's approval still stand? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, could I take that question in two parts? Firstly, uh, do I believe there's over-allocation? Yes, I do. And that is why we proposed the $10 billion plan, because the whole purpose of that plan was twofold. Uh, it was to reduce um, loss of water by piping and lining the irrigation channels, and that was going to account for about $6 billion. And there was about $3.5 billion that was going to be used to fund the buyback of over-allocated water. And if we'd received the cooperation we should have received from the Victorian government, then we would be further advanced towards that goal today than what we are. So I answer that first question. In relation to the second question, the decision as to whether an auction will go ahead in relation to the Warrigo is ultimately a decision of the Queensland government. And I've indicated to the, I've indicated to the Queensland Premier uh, that she should not go ahead with the um, uh, auction be, uh, in the light of the recommendations contained in the CSIRO, CSIRO report. Uh, and I drew her attention to that report two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Morton. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. Treasurer, is the Australian government concerned about the spread of poker machines and the effect of problem gambling on Australian families and individuals? And Treasurer, is there anything that can in fact be done to help curb this growing social problem? The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I thank the uh, honourable member for Morton for his uh, question, and uh, I can tell him that the Australian government is concerned about the spread of poker machines in Australia. In fact, uh, we were so concerned about it that we commissioned an inquiry by the Productivity Commission, which reported in 1999 that there are 130,000 problem gamblers in Australia. 160,000 at risk and another 500,000 to 1 million people affected by problem gamblers. Uh, problem gamblers account for 33 per cent of the industry revenue in relation to poker machines. So let, let me say that again. Problem gamblers account for one third of the revenue that comes through Australia's poker machines. On a per capita basis, Australia has roughly five times as many gaming machines as the United States, and those who are losing money tend to be those with lower income. The Productivity Commission found there is an inverse relationship between income levels and the density of gaming machines. That is, um, the higher the income, the less the density of gaming machines in a particular neighbourhood, and the converse applies. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, in 2004-05, all gambling activity was estimated to be at $15.4 billion, but poker machines in clubs and pubs accounted for $8.7 billion, or 56.3 per cent of gambling revenues in Australia. And Mr Speaker, um, uh, I noticed that uh, recently the uh, Leader of the Opposition also uh, expressed uh, his uh, concern about uh, poker machines and his regret at being part of the Queensland government's decision to introduce them when he was working for the Queensland government. And, uh, Mr Speaker, I think uh, it is a matter of concern the way in which state governments in the late 80s, early 90s embraced poker machines seeing them as an easy way of generating tax revenue and not looking at the social consequences uh, that uh, were involved. And so I uh, welcome the fact that the Leader of the Opposition has changed his position in relation to poker machines, and I do look forward to getting bipartisan support for the government's position in relation to this social 
ill. Uh, as a consequence of the Productivity Commission inquiry, the Australian government uh, set up a Commonwealth State Ministerial Forum to deal with those areas recommended by the Productivity Commission on consumer protection, counselling and research, and reform to regulatory governance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the uh, Ministerial Council on Gambling comprises both the Commonwealth and the states, and at the Commonwealth leadership has now agreed on a national framework to respond to problem gambling. We look forward to cooperation from the states in relation to that matters, and in some uh, areas uh, there have been positive steps, uh, such as warnings in relation to uh, gambling for people who might uh, be problem gamblers, uh, and uh, an increase for counselling services for those who suffer from this addiction. Uh, Mr Speaker, it is the Commonwealth's view that more can be done, particularly in restricting the availability of ATMs in venues where there are poker machines. Uh, the ATM, Mr Speaker, uh, does represent a uh, real temptation for a problem gambler who may have come with a fixed sum of money, gone through it, and now finds it easy to go to the ATM to continue their addiction. We would ask all of the states to cooperate with the Commonwealth in its active program to deal with this scourge, an area where the Commonwealth has taken leadership even though it has no legislative mm. power, and we would ask all of the states to cooperate in dealing with this matter. Let me say in conclusion, Mr Speaker, there is no reason why Australia would need more poker machines. Uh, at the moment, we have the highest level of poker machines in the country. There is no reason why we need any more and no reason for any state government whatsoever to believe that the introduction of Keno or other forms of interactive gambling could actually add to the social cohesion in our country. And we ask those state governments that are contemplating such a move not to go ahead with it. The Honourable Member for New England. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Environment and relates to a recent announcement of $6.5 million from the Australian Water Fund towards a $29 million upgrade of Chaffee Dam in my electorate. Minister, given that the Deputy Prime Minister declared that the funding was a done deal and not an election promise, how does the Minister explain comments in today's Financial Review, where his office states in relation to Chaffee Dam, and I quote, there were hurdles to clear before the Commonwealth funding could proceed, and that the project needed to be, and I quote, consistent with the principles of the National Water Initiative and the objectives of the National Plan for Water Security. Could the minister explain these inconsistencies between his office and that of Mr Vale's announcements, and could the minister guarantee to the people of Tamworth that the upgrade will proceed? The Honourable Minister for Environment and Water Resources. I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister's announcement on the 3rd of September uh, to contribute $6.5 million to the Chaffee Dam Augmentation Project uh, will improve water supply security for Tamworth and Peel Valley irrigators. Uh, it's important to, for the Honourable Member to, to, to remember that the funding is provided through the Australian Government Water Fund, which is administered by the National Water Commission. It's contingent, as is all funding through the Water Fund, on the National Water Commission being satisfied with the business plan and that the project is shown to be consistent with the National Plan for Water Security, the National Water Initiative and the Australian Government's environmental standards. The dam expansion uh, will undoubtedly be referred uh, for consideration under the, as a controlled action under the EPBC Act, so that is an environmental permitting hurdle that it has to meet. Uh, the funding is also contingent on the New South Wales government and other stakeholders meeting their agreed funding shares. Now, I'm confident that those, uh, or optimistic, I, perhaps I should say, that those conditions can be met, but they are in large measure in the hands of other people. But the honourable member must understand that all water funding out of the Australian Government Water Fund has to meet these or similar conditions. The Honourable Member for Cowper. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Treasurer, a man who understands tax policy unlike the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, yeah. Would the Treasurer inform the House of the importance of good tax policy to the Australian economy? Is the Treasurer aware of any alternative approaches? The Honourable the Treasurer. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I uh, thank the Honourable Member for Cowper for his question. I wish him well in the forthcoming election against the trade union candidate that the Labor Party is running against him. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker order, order, uh, the, the Australian Income Tax— The Treasurer Jimmy said the manager of the business— is misleading the House. That's not true, Mr. The Speaker. The member will resume his seat. That is not a point of order. The Treasurer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I uh, thank the honourable member for uh, Cowper. Uh, there's a 70 per cent chance that if you're running in the next election, the Labor Party candidate will be a trade union official of one kind or another, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I wish him all the best uh, in his uh, election activity. Now, Mr. Speaker, Australia's um, tax scales are uh, 15. 30 per cent, 40 per cent and 45 per cent. And, uh, Mr Speaker, they compare to the Labor Party's tax scales when it left office of 20 per cent, 34 per cent, 43 per cent and 47 per cent, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, so uh, not only have all uh, tax rates come down, but because thresholds have increased, for example, under Labor, the member for Melbourne Ports asked me what were they? Under Labor, your first dollar over fifty thousand dollars was taxed Order. at forty-seven cents. The in member the for Melbourne Ports. And Mr. Speaker, no wonder the Mel member for Melbourne Ports interjects. Yes, it's true. It was taxed at forty-seven cents. The in member the for Melbourne for Ports will not respond. I warn the member for Melbourne Mr. Ports. Speaker. Uh, the member for Melbourne Ports interjects again. Let me remind him, under the Labor Party, you were taxed at 47 cents in the dollar for each dollar over 50,000. Mr Speaker, under the coalition, once you go over 50,000, you won't be taxed at a marginal Order. tax rate higher than 30 per cent. And that's real tax reform and it's real tax reductions. Now, Mr Speaker, yesterday, of course, the Leader of the Opposition was asked to name the tax rates and the tax thresholds. Uh, Mr Order. Speaker, he was unable to name a single tax rate. He was unable to name the 15 per cent rate. Was he able to name the 30 per cent rate? Was he able to name the 40 per cent rate? Was he able to name the 45 per cent rate? Was he able to name any rate? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, what he named was a threshold that doesn't exist. And uh, here's the spin merchants of the Labor Party yesterday. They were saying Mr Rudd's office said he had made a mistake. He was just $5,000 out, not the $25,000 the government claimed. Well, Mr Speaker, he was $25,000 out, but that's not the point. The point is he didn't Order. know a single a rate, Blackson. not a single tax rate, let alone a threshold. Now, Mr Speaker, um, uh, enter stage right the member for Lilly. <laughs> now, the member for Lilly had uh, had another explanation as to why uh, the uh, the leader of the opposition should be excused. Um, have a listen to this. The member for Lilly was asked this morning, "Don't you need to know where you're going from to where you're going to?" On oh, it's not bad. And the member for Lilly said this. We absolutely know where we're going to because, you see, we authored the current tax cuts that are in the system. <laughs> we authored the current tax cuts that are in the system. Listen to this. 85 cents in every dollar of the tax cuts in this year's budget were authored by the Labor Party, Mr Speaker. Well, Blow me down. When I wrote that budget speech, yeah. I didn't realise yeah. yeah. my hand had been overcome by the Labor Party. Yeah, you know, hair had gone dark. I was going to say, it's getting pretty spooky, isn't it? <laughs> my budgets are now being authored by the Labor Party. <laughs> if I really believed that, I'd stand down, Mr Speaker. <laughs> but uh, it gets even spookier. 
because uh, last night on the uh, on today tonight on today tonight um, members will know that the leader Order. of the opposition Order. the leader of the opposition specialises in asking himself questions and giving the answer. Mr. Re Mr. Speaker, the reason he specialises in asking himself questions is they're the only ones he can answer. And he, he got on today tonight last night and he said this. Someone asked me the other day, who do you model yourself on? And I said, ah, Kevin, I'm just me. That's pretty spooky because now he's modelling himself on himself, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last year he was modelling himself on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But he's found an even better role model now, Mr. Move aside, Dietrich. I'm now modelling myself on myself, he says. He's now, he's now authoring, ta authoring tax rates that he doesn't know exists, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, he's now auditioning for a job that he is not up to. That's the most important point. He's authoring, auditioning for a job that he's not up to. Order. He hasn't Order. done the work. The he doesn't the Lily. understand the economy, and he is not ready to Order. be a leader in Australia. The member for Denison. The member for Denison. I would ask. I would ask the treasurer to table the document that he was reading from with all the rates that he was referring to. Yeah. Was the Treasurer quoting from a confidential document? I was reading from Wayne Swan yeah. doorstop interview, Parliament House Canberra, which I, uh, I tabled, and I was reading, Mr Speaker, from Kev's Affair to Remember, Kev's Affair to Remember on the campaign trail. The Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger. Thank <coughs> the Member for Bass. The Member for Jagger Jagger has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister assure the House that no person associated with the government or the Liberal Party was responsible for backgrounding journalists over recent days on the details of the opposition leader's private medical history. Order, order. The member for Jagger Jagger has the call. The member for O'Connor. The member for Jagger Jagger. Can the order, order. The the Minister for Foreign Affairs. The member for Jagger Jagger has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Prime Minister assure the House that the government or the Liberal Party has not engaged private investigators or forensic accountants to examine the private affairs of Labor members or candidates? The Honourable the Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, this is an outrageous smear masquerading as a question. An outrageous order. smear masquerading as a question, and it should be ruled out of order. Absolutely out of order, Mr order. Speaker. They have no evidence. Just a blatant order. smear, and this bloke should not the leader authorise of the house these sorts of questions. Seat. The Leader of the House resume his seat. I have not ruled on anything. The manager of opposition business will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business will resume his seat. The first part of the question in relation to the Prime Minister's responsibilities is in order. The Prime Minister is not to be held responsible for party matters. I call the Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm very happy to answer the question. I can provide an absolute assurance. Uh, of a number of things that I certainly had nothing to do with, that I was not aware of these things. Order. Well, look, I can't. Mr. Speaker, I can provide an absolute assurance to the House uh, that I had absolutely nothing to do with this. I am not aware of where it came from. 
I am not aware of any suggestion that it came from any member of my party. I am not aware of any suggestion that it came from any member of my government, Mr Speaker. I regard the question as contemptible. I, I believe that the member for Jagger Jagger has deliberately asked this question to generate a Melbourne false back. view that my party and my government are responsible for smearing the Leader of the Opposition. That's right. Well, Mr Speaker, let me, let me make Order. a couple of things very clear to the member for Jagger Jagger. The first thing I would make clear is that I wish the Leader of the Opposition a long and healthy life in his current job. Mr. Speaker. That's the first thing that I wish the Leader of the Opposition. I have never observed in the Leader of the Opposition's demeanour um, any suggestion that he has other than robust health. My argument with the Leader of the Opposition is not in relation to matters of individual physical fitness. I have no doubt about his physical fitness any more than he should have any doubt about my physical fitness. My, my, my argument, Mr Speaker, my argument with the Leader of the Opposition is about his um, uh, lack of credibility for the job he aspires to concerning matters quite unrelated to his health. I have never raised his health. I have never asked anybody to raise his health, and I think it is a, a piece of contemptible smearing by the member for Jagger Jagger to raise this, Mr. Speaker. I mean, everyone knows the leader of the opposition, and, and, and everybody knows that a question is not asked in this house without the authority of the leader, Mr. Speaker. And, and do I regard, I regard this question as Kevin Rudd's question, Mr. Speaker. I don't regard this question Order. as Jenny Macklin's. This question was authored by the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker. And it was authored by the Leader of the Opposition, and I know exactly, Mr Speaker, what has happened. The Leader of the Opposition had a bad day at the office yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and they have decided that the retaliation is to spear my party. Now, can I just say very directly through you, Mr Speaker, uh, there has been no engagement, Mr Speaker, of private investigators. That is an absolute contemptible falsehood, Mr Speaker. There has been no engagement of private investigators, and Mr Speaker, at no stage Mr Speaker, has any, any conduct of any kind designed to smear the Leader of the Opposition on the basis of his lack of good health been encouraged, counselled, sought or in any way procured by me. I would reject any attempt to do so. I can beat the Leader of the Opposition without resort to smears. Members on both sides of the chamber are not adding, adding to the dignity of the House. <laughs> Members are holding up their question time. The Honourable Member for Blair. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Would the Deputy Prime Minister inform the House how the government's plans for infrastructure are helping to improve our roads and to keep motorists safe, particularly in my electorate of Blair? The Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the, uh, the Member for Blair for his question. Uh, uh, a real question about a real issue that uh, uh, is of interest to Australians, particularly in regional Australia, and uh, that is what the government is doing in terms of 
the deployment of the prosperity in this country to improve the infrastructure, particularly in regional Australia, uh, to the benefit uh, of all Australians. Uh, and the member for Blair would be well aware of the significant commitment uh, uh, and the appropriate decisions that have been taken by the government in terms of investing in that infrastructure. In uh, uh, the budget this year, $22.3 billion across a range of infrastructure programs, and many of which that are actually uh, helping the constituents uh, in the electorate of Blair, uh, ably represented by, uh, by the current member for Blair, Mr Speaker, and the interest he takes uh, in their well-being. And of course, uh, I mentioned yesterday about one major piece of infrastructure that the government took a very long-term strategic view about, uh, took leadership uh, and took a decision to invest uh, $2.3 billion in the Goodna Bypass. But there are other very important roads that we are funding across the nation. Uh, that we took a decision uh, to go straight to local government and provide funding to local roads because the states were failing in their responsibility to support local roads. And under the, uh, the very popular Roads to Recovery program, uh, we are delivering significant amounts of money to local government and helping local people in their local communities to make their roads safer and more efficient. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and one in particular uh, project in the members' electorate, uh, we've contributed a million dollars uh, towards the replacement of the Three Mile Bridge that provides very important access to Amberley RAAF base uh, in the members' electorate. Um, might be a small project, but it's a very, very important project to that local community. And that circumstance is replicated right across Australia. We took a decision in 2001, uh, and it's something that this government has always been able to do, is take decisions when they are required uh, to allocate $307 million a year to local government across Australia. As of 2009, going through to 2014, that will grow to $350 million a year in the Roads to Recovery program. Mr Speaker, since we were elected in 1996, we've maintained the Roads Black Spots funding program that had been axed by the Labor Party, the former Labor government, uh, which has been incredibly important to uh, local communities uh, like those in the electorate of Blair across Australia. Now, that Black Spots program over that period of time is estima estimated to uh, have saved at least 130 Australian lives on the roads, it saved 6,000 serious accidents and it's upgraded 4,200 dangerous sites on local roads in every small community across Australia. Mr. Speaker. It's been funded at $45 million a year and we're going to increase it to $60 million a year uh, directed into local communities across Australia. Now, the member asked about um, uh, any threats to this and alternative policies. Well, we know that the, the member for Batman has said, well, uh, we support uh, the Osling funding. We want to see it go ahead. Well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, but that's contrary to what the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition has announced uh, in that he wants to have another inquiry. He wants to set up another bureaucracy. Uh, so it's actually uh, inquiry or review number 37 out of 97 uh, is the National Infrastructure Audit. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've been through all this process. We've identified what needs to be done in Australia. We're getting on with doing it. We've got the wherewithal to do it. We're funding it uh, out of budget surpluses, not out of debt and deficit in this country. And that's the hallmark of our government, Mr. Uh, Speaker. So we are a government of action. The Labor Party would be a government of inaction, uh, choked up with reviews and inquiries into what needs to be done in the country. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Strong leadership is about making decisions where and when they are needed. Weak leadership is about having more inquiries and more reviews. The Honourable the Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer to an article which appeared in The Australian on 27 June 2007 concerning the purchase of Kevin Rudd and Therese Rain's family home in Brisbane. Is the Prime Minister aware that this article states, and I quote, Liberal Party figures in Queensland, including a forensic accountant, have been examining the purchase and the links between the vendors and the Labor Party's investment companies for several months. Is this report correct? Order. Order. The, before well, the Leader of the House. Point of order. Again, again, again Mr Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, this is a smear in the guise of a order, question. Order, the leader of the this, house. This, this bloke the doesn't have the guts to do his own. Seat. The leader of the house will resume his seat.
the, the manager of opposition business has asked a question, and I haven't even ruled, called, called to anyone to answer the question. The, the manager does not move a point of order, but he may raise a point of order. Point of order the Mr. manager of opposition business. Mr Speaker, twice now the Leader of the House has stood up in the guise of, I, I guess, moving a point of order, hasn't referred to standing orders, has just, uh, has just echoed abuse across this chamber. I ask you to pull him into line. The, the Manager of Opposition Business raises a valid point of order on that last uh, point raised by the Leader of the House. In re relation to the question, I'm having difficulty in working out where that is within the Prime Minister's responsibility. Unless the Manager of Opposition Business can rephrase that question, I'll have to rule it out of order. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. And I refer to an article which appeared in The Australian on the 27th of June 2007 concerning the purchase of Kevin Rudd and Therese Rain's family home in Brisbane. I also refer to the direct quote in that article, quoted, Liberal Party figures in Queensland, including the, a forensic accountant, the, have been examining the purchase and the links between the vendors and the Labor Party's investment companies for several months. Can, the, the manager of opposition business has can not the pro, brought I, that. I'm going to. Well, the manager will get straight th to thanks, the Mr. Speaker. Can the can the Prime Minister assure the House that no government members or Liberal Party members were involved the, in this activity? The Prime Minister cannot be held responsible for anything relating to party matters, but in relation to government members, uh, he may, he, he can, I will call the Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I can certainly assure the House that I haven't set out to do any of the things suggested by the opposition, nor, in, to my knowledge, of any of my parliamentary colleagues. I can also inform the House that since um, the question uh, authored by the Leader of the Opposition was asked by the member for Jagger Jagger, I have been informed by the Federal Director of the Liberal Party that he is not aware of, nor he has been in any way responsible for the appointment of any private investigators to investigate the affairs of the Leader of the Opposition. He's authorised me to say that on behalf of the Liberal Party organisation. And, uh, Mr Speaker, he is prepared to publicly say, he is prepared to publicly refute the allegations the Leader of the Opposition is not prepared to make even under parliamentary privilege. The, the Honourable Treasurer. I move that so much of standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition detailing to the House forthwith the smear allegations which he is putting against the Prime Minister, the Liberal Party and the Get Government. Accepted. Is it accepted? The, is it, is it leave is it accepted? Accepted? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, the order. not accepted. Order. The Let me then has move, Mr. Speaker, to suspend the standing and sessional orders, so that the leader of the opposition can come to this dispatch box now and, with his own mouth, make the allegations that he's putting through the member for Jager Jager, that he's putting through the member for Grainler but which he doesn't have the decency to put himself, Mr Speaker. You can't come into this place and sit there and pretend you've not got nothing to do with what's going on. You can't come into this place and turn your back. You can't come into this place and studiously write nothing on a piece of paper and pretend, Mr Speaker, and pretend, Mr. Speaker that those that are getting up around you have nothing to do with you. I have an unfortunate fact for the Leader of the Opposition. These are your team. These are your people. They worked on your instructions. And, Mr Speaker, anybody who has been around this place long enough knows nobody can come to the dispatch box on the Opposition and ask a question except if the Leader of the Opposition authorised them to do so. It is absolutely inconceivable that the member for Jager Jager could have walked to this dispatch box, could have put a slur on the Prime Minister, 
could have put a slur on the government, could have put a slur on the Liberal Party, except she was authorised to do so by Kevin Rudd, the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Mr Speaker, uh, as for this uh, saintly persona that he's some kind of pale imitation of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Mr Speaker, that just makes the fraud worse, frankly, to actually be hiding behind this saintly image when you're prepared to have other people go out and do your dirty work for you, Mr Speaker, actually makes the fraud worse. So what are the allegations that are now being put by uh, Kevin Rudd, the Leader of the Opposition, against the Prime Minister? Well, the first insinuation and allegation that's been put, of course, is that somehow the Prime Minister or the Leader of uh, or the Government or uh, the Liberal Party had, uh, had uh, put out a story in relation to his own health, Mr Speaker. Can I say, aside from wishing him a long life, which I'm sure we all do, nobody on this side of the parliament has any interest at all in his medical conditions. I have no more interest in his medical conditions or any of his front bench's medical conditions than I hope they have interest in my medical condition. And Mr Speaker, far from this being a great uh, secret— oh, oh, you do have Order. great interest, do you? Oh, I would have thought that was a smear, was it not? Perhaps you could go and talk to people about it, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, but uh, we find out, do we not, uh, on the Channel 7 News today, and Channel 7 would know about this, we find out uh, Smith, who I believe to be Stephen Smith, uh, was, uh, was uh, out there quoted today, according to the news report, saying there was no need to dig dirt. Kevin Rudd revealed he had a transplant three and a half years ago on Seven Sunrise. <laughs> All right, it wasn't this Smith. There was another Smith then, Mr Speaker, who, according to uh, Channel 7 News, I take it back, it must have been a reporter, it was a Smith, certainly, because I've got the transcripts, who said there was no need to dig this Order. dirt. Order. Kevin Order. Rudd revealed Order. he had a transplant three Members and a half on my years left. ago. Members on, on my Sunday. left. So far from this being a great secret, Mr Speaker, far from this being a great secret, who in fact had revealed this piece of information? None other than the Leader of the Opposition himself. And when it becomes public, Mr Speaker, who, who does he try and frame up and fit up with the allegation? None other than the Prime Minister, the Liberal Party and the government. Mr Speaker, to think that the government would bother itself to think that the government would bother itself with a medical condition which occurred many, many years ago, when Mr. Speaker, he's on political life support. He's on political life support. He's not on medical life support. Here we are yesterday. He's completely shown himself to be an ignoramus on tax policy. He can't name a single rate. He can't name a single threshold. He's been humiliated Order. in the House of Representatives. And so what would the logical thing to do be for the government? Try and knock that story off the new evening news bulletins with an old story about a heart condition. Who in their right mind would think about doing this? Who in their right mind might have motivation to knock that story? Order. To knock that story off the evening news. And I must say I'm very surprised myself very surprised myself to see that this story came up last night and knocked a tax story down the batting order on Channel 9. And we had the Leader of the Opposition sitting there giving one of his serious exclusives to Laurie Oakes in relation to the medical condition. Well, Mr Speaker, all right, the medical condition came out last night, but to say that the government would have spiked its own story would have spiked its own story by putting that out yesterday, beggar's belief. Beggar's belief. Let us, ask, let us ask what possible motivation would there have been. And let me say, if you don't want to look at motivation, let me say what the fact was. The government had nothing to do with that. The Liberal Party had nothing to do with that. And the Prime Minister had nothing to do with that. And Mr Speaker, to come in here and to put up the member for Jager Jager to try and make that insinuation is low base politics, and it tells us something about the low base nature of the Leader of the Opposition. And then, Mr. Speaker, just in case you thought this wasn't a planned tactic today, 
We then had the old member for Grindler himself, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Oh, Mr. Dirty Tricks himself comes to the dispatch box. He comes out with this article that's been in the Australian some time ago, June, I think it was June. So concerned about it in June, wasn't he, that he got up and he asked the question when it was in the Australian? He'd been asking about it every day, has he, since June? Did he ask about it on Tuesday? Did he ask about it on Wednesday? So concerned about that article in June he was that he just happens to get up in a coordinated way with the member for Jager Jager and he says, poor old Kevin. Poor old Kevin's been subject to a bit of uh, search and scrutiny in relation to his private affairs. Well, I can tell you, I've been in public life for 17 years. I've been the treasurer for 11 years, and it is not a new thing to have scrutiny on your personal life, Mr. Speaker. It's not a new thing, and I've got to say to you, if uh, if you think, Mr. Speaker, that somebody uh, somebody uh, looking at uh, your financials is a new thing, I don't think you're in this house. When Gareth, when Gareth Evans got up and attacked my wife for owning shares. I don't think you were in the House when that happened. I don't think you were in the House when Alexander Downer's wife was attacked. I don't think you were in the House when Paul Keating attacked Sir Alexander Downer as being some kind of war coward, although he'd been a POW in Changi during the Second World War. Oh boy, we've seen some attacks in this House over the years. We've seen some personal attacks. And let me say this, the Leader of the Opposition, far from having personal attacks, has probably had the easiest run from the media of a Leader of the Opposition in a very long period of time. Mr Speaker, it's been an easy run. It's been an easy run. And the first sign, Mr Speaker, he shows himself to be extremely fragile extremely touchy. He's willing, Mr Speaker, to try and impeach the reputation of other people in order to make a political point. This is not the, this is not the, uh, this is not the character, nor is it the behaviour of somebody who's ready to take tough decisions if he ever gets into a position of responsibility in this country. This is not the position, Mr Speaker, of someone who wants to talk about policy. This is the last question time. It could well be the last question time before the election. And as far as you're concerned, you would want it to be the last question time. And Mr Speaker, do we hear about policy? Order. Do we hear about Order. plans? Mr. Order. Speaker, do we hear about any of those Order. things? No, Mr Order. Speaker. Order. Members on my we left. We hear an attempt to smear and we hear an attempt to divert. Order. Mr Speaker, he ought to get on his feet. He ought to get Order. up. Order. 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 The member for Oxley will remove himself under Standing Order 94A. The question, Order. The question is that the motion to suspend standing and session orders be agreed to. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And I move that all words after that be deleted with the following Order. words and submitted. Order. That Order. this House repudiates the consistent negative year-long campaign by the government against the Opposition, rather than advancing its own positive plans for Australia's future. Well, just now, Mr. Speaker, Order. we Order. have been Members witness right. to arrogance unleashed. Order. Arrogance unleashed Order. by the Treasurer, the would-be Prime Minister of this country, who has lacked courage Order. year in, year out, month in, month out, to have the ticker to do anything about his heartfelt aspirations and ambition to eliminate this man. It takes a lot of uh, courage, Mr. Speaker, to wander around, to wander around each restaurant in this town and badmouth the Prime Minister. It takes a lot of courage to wander around each person in the press gallery and badmouth the Prime Minister. It takes a lot of courage in Melbourne, Treasurer, to wander around your favourite eating haunts and badmouth the Prime Minister. But what it does take, Treasurer, is courage, conviction and commitment to stand up for your principles and stand for something. It takes courage and conviction to actually summon forth 
the courage and conviction to put your hand up and to challenge this man for the leadership of the Liberal Party. Courage and conviction, which you have lacked all year. And now you have to be defended by the seat. The Leader of the Opposition is in his seat. All members, all members are I haven't called the Leader of the Opposition. The Order. The Leader of the Opposition. Order. Order. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Order. 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 I've called the Leader, leader of the House. I cannot hear him, and nor I think can anyone else. The Leader of the House has the call, and he will be Mr. heard. Mr. Speaker, it's a point of order on relevance. Uh, this motion is about the opposition leader substantiating his smear. Order. He has to substantiate his smear. Uh, he order. can't just. Order. I... He, he, he can order. pass the all the characters. The, the Leader of the House is Jimmy Seat. The Leader of the House is raising a point of order. I'm having great difficulty hearing a single word. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition can cast all the reflections that he likes on the Treasurer's character, but he is required by this motion to substantiate the smear, and you should require him to substantiate the smear and to debate the motion. The Leader, the leader of the House was in his seat. The, the, the Treasurer has moved a suspension of standing orders. The Leader of the Opposition has moved an amendment. And I call the Leader of the Opposition. And in calling him, I would ask all members to show a little bit more courtesy. And so, Mr Speaker, when it comes to the behaviour of this Treasurer, the gap between courage and performance, the gap between a person who consistently and routinely badmouths the Prime Minister, yet who stands up in the bully pulpit of the ministerial dispatch box and then proclaims to the country at large Order. that he is a person of Order. strong heart and strong House. courage, underlines the deep the hypocrisy which resides in your breast. And when it comes to the whole question of negative smear tactics, uh, Mr Speaker, why are these matters raised in the Parliament? In the last 24 hours, we've had the extraordinary spectacle of the Chief of Staff of the Special Minister of State. The Special Minister of State engaging in a campaign of Order. personal smear and innuendo against the Labor candidate for Eden Monero. The Labor candidate for Eden Monero, Colonel Mike Kelly. His curriculum vitae describes what he has done, deployed Order. to Somalia, Order. Operation Restore Hope at Legal Advisor 1st Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment Battalion Group. Yet what we have, Prime Minister, is your Chief of Staff of that minister going out and describing Mike Kelly as order. a representative order, order, order. of the Belson the Guards. The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Leader of the House this is a point a, of order. This is a relevance point of order. The Leader uh, of the House will resume his seat. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. The le Leader of the Opposition is in order. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. On the question of the engagement by the Chief of Staff of the Special Minister of State, order. what we see is a pattern of behaviour on behalf order. of this government and a manager of government business sitting there sanctimoniously believing that he is not aware of the negative campaigns being run against various members of the opposition over time frankly flies in the face of the facts when it comes to the activities order, most order, recently order. engaged leader, in the leader, of the leader of the opposition is in his seat i haven't called the leader of the house the leader of the house on a point of order yes mr speaker he the leader of the opposition has accused me of complicity in a smear campaign. What is his evidence? 
How can he substantiate the his claim? The leader of the house was Jimmy Seat. The leader of the house was Jimmy Seat. Feet. We manager of opposition business. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Will you take action against the leader the of the house? Manager of opposition business will not reflect on the chair. I. The leader of the opposition is in order, and the leader of the house has an opportunity to debate this matter further if he wishes to. The leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, the purpose of the parliament is for the opposition to pose questions to the executive, and the purpose of the parliament is to get answers from the executive. When, therefore, we have a report in the Nation's newspaper in an article by Hedley Thomas which says Liberal Party figures in Queensland, including a forensic accountant, have been examining the purchase and links between the vendors and the Labor Party's investment companies for several months, I would have thought, Mr Speaker, that a forum for asking whether that is true or not is the Parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia. Order. Because Order. what we know Members on my fact, right. Because what we know for a fact, Mr Speaker, is that whenever asked beyond this place as to the truth of these things, the actual pressure placed on ministers to answer truthfully is business much business less is than that which applies in this place here. Now, the second question is this. We then have an article most recently Order. by Jason Katsukas in the Sunday Age, which, which begins this. The phone rang one evening last week. This is on the 9th of September, Prime Minister. And a familiar voice at the other end said, I've got something for you. It's hot. So hot, I thought I could hear it sizzling. Come down for a chat, the man suggested, all very hushed and strictly on the QT. Walking through the corridors of power to meet my trusted source, dreaming of Watergate, I half wish we were meeting in a dingy car park and Order. not a plush ministerial suite Order. where I was headed. Into the meeting I waltzed and there was my source beaming behind two glasses of red and a fat manila folder with the most misunderstood noun in the coalition lexicon scrawled across the front, Gillard. Yeah. That is only two weeks old. Mr. Oh. Mr. Speaker, the Order. sensitivity, Order. The on, sensitivity my right. on the part of the manager of government business, the treasurer and the prime minister, Order. Order. The when these the opposite, questions— me see. Members on my right. The Leader of the Opposition has the right to be heard. I call the Leader of the Opposition. So, Mr Speaker, when these uncomfortable questions are asked of the government, they wish to engage in all sorts of feigned outrage as if these things have never happened, that Mr Katsukas made all that up, that Heathy Thomas made all that up. The bare minimum level of accountability is to have, Order. in fact, an answer to these questions. Order. And on the Members question on you, you right. raise in relation to medical documents, the of the House. on the question you raise in the relation of the to medical House documents, the Leader of the House is warned. On the question you raise in relation to medical documents, there has been reference some years ago to me being recipient of an organ transplant, but never a, represent, uh, never a representation of any cardiac procedure. That is the first time that has been put into the public debate, and those opposite know it. Treasurer, you aspire to be Prime Minister of this country. You have moved this motion in the House. You lack the courage to ever be Prime Minister of this country. Order. The Leader's time has expired. The Leader of the, leader of the Opposition has time has expired. Is is the amendment moved by the leader of the opposition seconded? The honourable deputy leader of the opposition. I second the amendment. Is the deputy leader wish to speak? I'm more than happy to, Mr. The Speaker. I'm more than happy to. Mr Speaker, over here we have them carrying on as if offended, as if offended by the allegation that they put together dirt files, as if offended by the allegation that they go after members of this parliament personally, when the evidence is there for all to see. Order. They have, Order. Well, members on my right. Let, let's listen to the evidence. We have spent this week hearing about how a government staff member, a chief of staff to a minister, made one of the most repulsive allegations you can make against Order. another human being, and that is to compare them to a Nazi, to compare them to someone who administered a concentration camp where thousands of people died. And when we first raised that in this parliament, 
what action, what answer did we get from the Howard government? Not an answer about immediate action, not an answer about revulsion, not an answer about how they were disgusted by that remark. No, on the first occasion the minister walked to the dispatch box, he squirmed and said absolutely nothing. Then on the second occasion he walked to the dispatch box, he obviously thought better of it and sought to distance himself ever so softly from the remark. Of course, his chief of staff had been out that morning basically carrying on and justifying himself. Then it took hours, absolutely hours, for this matter to finally end up in an apology, to finally end up in an apology from the staff member involved. And still, of course, no Howard government minister, not one of them, has taken any meaningful action about this matter, not one of them. Then, of course, on the matter that the Leader of the Opposition referred to, which dealt with uh, me, Mr Speaker, dealt with me. What we know on the public record is that a journalist, Jason Kotsukas, was invited down to a meeting in a ministerial suite, in a ministerial suite for the purpose of being supplied with a file with my name on it, which had been trawled through the press gallery as a dirt file. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm not, I'm not saying when we look at this that we should uh, be talking about the contents. I don't know what the contents are. The dirt file hasn't been supplied to me. Order, but the, the, suggestion, the suggestion, the suggestion, the suggestion. Well, it has been used. It has been used, Foreign Minister, because someone in this government sat in a ministerial suite and gave it to a journalist. Now, for the members of for the, the members, of, for for the members of this government to suggest that somehow they the are mortally, of foreign affairs offended, is worn. mortally offended by the suggestion that they peddle dirt, well, how does anyone explain that? Whose office was it? Have we got an answer to that? Whose office was it, Prime Minister? You're so concerned about the reputation of your government. Are you going to make inquiries about that? Are you going to make sure you find out the truth about that? Or that's all right, is it? Your little moral outrage only goes so far, and under the moral outrage on the surface, there is all of this unseemly conduct going on underneath Order. that you avert your eyes from, but you know is occurring. You must know is occurring. So don't come into this parliament with a holier-than-thou attitude when beneath this modicum of moral outrage on the surface, underneath we've got the trawling and the dirt Order. and the carry-on. We Patterson. come to question time in this parliament and we ask questions for the purpose of getting answers. We ask questions for the purpose of getting answers. And what do we routinely see from ministers in this government? We see evasion and we see personal attacks. Indeed, the only thing some government ministers do in this place during question time is personal attacks. The only thing they do. The only, when they are asked questions by their own backbench about government policy, they are lucky if there are two or three words about government policy and the rest of it is personal attack. This is the ordinary stock in trade of this government when it comes to the prosecution of its politics. And we know, we know that this is just the start and that there is weeks and weeks of this to come in the future. It's been talked about, it's been rumoured. We know that government rumoured rumoured by, by this government Order. and its members who have put out little teasers to the press about what is to come. We know that this is what they peddle under the surface, and the truth is you know it as well. The members of the government front bench, the members of the back bench know it as well. So let's Order. not actually fall for this overacting. Order. This the deputy leader's display. time has expired. The Honourable the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent Mr. debate Speaker, on this motion being the extended the until the Member Grain will resume his seat. And the Member Grain will resume his seat. And, and the PM the Leader of the, the House has the call and I will hear what he says. Member Grain will resume his seat, I'll deal with him. You can't move a point of order. Not, 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 if, not, if, not while I'm in the middle of moving a motion. The Leader of the House has the call, and I will hear the Leader of the House. And the Member for Grain will resume his seat. The Mr. Member, 
Reynolds, you've been seated, hasn't, and I call the Leader of the House. Uh, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent debate on this motion being extended until 3.34 p.m. and the Prime Minister speaking without interruption for a period not exceeding 10 minutes. Order. The, order. The manager of opposition business. Yes, Mr Speaker. The time allocated for a suspension the of standing orders of is 25 minutes. The manager of it opposition has, business will resume expired. his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. I'll deal with him. The Leader of the House was called before the expiration of the time, and the Leader of the House has now moved to an extension of the time. The Manager of Opposition Business. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. The 10 plus 10 plus 5 equals 25. I warn the Manager Mr. of Opposition Speaker, Business. And time had expired. I name the, the Manager of Opposition Business. The Leader of the House. I move. Uh, 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 Mr. Speaker, I move uh, that the member for uh, Greenland be suspended from the service of the House. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the member for Grain will be suspended from the services of the House. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Riverina tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Shortland and Melbourne Ports tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 83, noes 54. The member for Grainler is therefore suspended uh, for 24 hours. The Honourable Leader of the House. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, as my motion hasn't been stated to the House, I therefore withdraw it and move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Prime Minister speaking without interruption Order. for 10 minutes on the question that the words proposed to be amended by the Leader of the Opposition stand part of the question. Right. The Honourable Member for Scullin. Mr Speaker, under Standing Order 67, may I request that you state the question that is before you at the moment? The question that is before the House is a new motion just put by the Leader of the House. He has withdrawn his earlier motion. And as he is, I'll, I'll, read, I'll read the motion. Uh, the member for Scullin, I will I'll read, I'll read the motion for the benefit of the House. The, the order, member for Scullin. Before you do that. No. No, just listen, Ginger. You, Mr. Speaker, I say to you that you haven't stated that question. The Leader of the House may have moved it, but you have not stated it. It is not the business before the House. The Speaker has not stated it. He usually he does that at the end of the, the, the movers debate. I thank the member for Scullin. I remind the member order. I, the member for Scullin will resume his seat. I will respond to the member for Scullin. The, I, I say to the member for Scullin, the Leader of the House had the had the call. And then we had a, uh, shall we say, a diversion where there was some disciplinary action taken. Therefore, the call that had been given to the Leader of the House was restated, and the Leader of the House has now put a motion. And I'll read the motion. He moves that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended that the Prime Minister, as would allow the Prime Minister speaking without interruption for 10 minutes on the question that the words proposed permitted by the Leader of the Opposition stand. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I move an amendment to the motion you've just read to add the following after the word 10 minutes and that the Prime Minister use this time to outline his plan for Australia's future and that the order, order. Please. And that the leader, Le leader of the opposition, leader opposition be given equal time to respond, and that this is the debate that the Australian people want to hear. Order. Order. We have a motion before the House, and the leader of the opposition has moved an amendment. The, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker. This provides the House with an opportunity on what the Treasurer Order. has indicated is being its last day. Order. What the Treasurer is indicating to be its last day for the Prime Minister to put the Australian people his plan for Australia's future. The, Prime, the Treasurer has said often Order. Order. The that the uh, he wishes to be Prime Minister. 
The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I move that the question be put. The question is that the amendment moved by Order. Order. The question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be put, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point the honourable members for Karangamite and Riverina tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Shortland and Melbourne Ports tell us for the noes. Thank you. 
Order. The result of the division is ayes 83, noes 54. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative, and I now put the question on the motion moved by the Leader of the House. The House has just moved that the motion be put. The Member for Melbourne. Point of order is, Mr. Speaker, I'd ask you to rule on the meaning of the term without interruption in the motion. Does this mean that the Prime Minister is able to make any accusation, any claim, without the right of a member to make a point of order or to demand a withdrawal? Is that the meaning of the term without interruption in this motion, to protect him from the kind of treatment that the Leader of the House put out to Order. the, no, the, the member Leader of the Opposition? Seat. The Member for Melbourne resume his seat. I say to the uh, Member for Melbourne, until the motion has actually been put and agreed to, that, that is a hypothetical question. The, the member, for Melbourne, member for Melbourne, I have a motion before the chair. I have to deal with it. The me, member for Melbourne, the, I have taken note of the member for Melbourne. The member for Melbourne will resume his seat. The question is that so much of the session of standing orders be suspended as would allow the Prime Minister speaking without interruption for 10 minutes on the question that the words proposed to be admitted by the Leader of the Opposition stand. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable the Prime Minister. The, 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 the member for Melbourne. I'd invite you to rule, Mr Speaker, as to the meaning of the phrase without interruption that has just been passed by the House as to whether that means that if the Prime Minister makes any accusation against a member, that Order. member is unable to respond, whether Order. the Prime Minister I will respond whether to the, the Prime Minister Melbourne. makes any claim the, that nobody can raise a point of order. Is that your interpretation? I'll respond to his question. My interpretation is that if without interruption means no points of order. If the if another member wishes to move a further motion, if a the member for Melbourne resume his seat. If another member wishes to move another motion in response to uh, anything that may be raised during this debate, then of course there are procedures with the House. I call the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has a call. The, I have called the Prime Minister and the member for Melbourne will resume his seat. The member for Melbourne resume his seat. Or I'll deal with him. The member for Melbourne resume his seat. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, um, I know it uh, seems quite a long time ago, but this issue started when the member for Jagger Jagger asked me a question which we all know. Uh, was uh, more an accusation than a question. Uh, what, in effect, the member for Jagger Jagger was doing, presumably with the authority of the Leader of the Opposition, what the member for Jagger Jagger was doing was alleging that either I or, with the my member knowledge, Parramatta. members of the government had raised issues about the physical health of the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker. That is how it started. Now, by any measure, by any use of the English language, an accusation of that kind represents, in the absence of evidence supporting it, an accusation of that kind 
represents about the basest possible smear that can be made in this place, Mr Speaker. That is why we decided to move a motion inviting the true author of that base accusation to substantiate to the parliament why he believed that I and or members of my government were responsible for smearing him in relation to his health. Can I say through you to the Leader of the Opposition, as an individual I bear him no malice. I do not wish him well politically, but I wish him no harm on a personal basis, nor do I wish him other than a long and healthy and happy life as an individual, Mr Speaker. And I would suggest that any Order. Australians Order. that may be listening to this debate, any in the gallery, are frankly, if I can put it bluntly, more interested in the health of their nation than they are in the health of either the Leader of the Opposition the or of me, Mr warned. Speaker. And it, and it passes strange that a few moments ago the Leader of the Opposition sort of raised this issue while the Prime Minister and I should be debating our respective future plans for the government of the country. Now, not a bad point, Mr Speaker. Well, I might Order. say rhetorically in reply, why on earth, therefore, did the Leader of the Opposition waste a question through the mouth of the member for Jagger Jagger about a smear instead of asking me a question about the policy the of the government? Of the Mr Speaker, let me just state it very, very simply to those who sit opposite. The allegation, about the, the allegation made by the member for Jagger Jagger is baseless. The allegation made by the, the member Leader of the Melbourne. Opposition is baseless. We have not been the spreading for smears about the Leader of the Opposition's health. Mr. The Speaker, member for Jagger Jagger is warned. I mean, I, I'm, a great believer, I'm a great believer in the, uh, in the doctrine of coincidence in politics, Mr Speaker. Now, what is coincidental? What is coincidental, Mr Speaker? Yesterday, the Leader of the Opposition, by any measure, has a very bad day. I mean, he had a very bad day. He couldn't, he but couldn't answer the, the most simple question about taxation. So we, you know, then we have questions raised in the Parliament about that issue, and then we go on to the evening news bulletins. And out of the blue, out of the blue, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the member for and I was, is warned. I, was, I have to say, I was, I was totally surprised to turn on the Channel 9 news, expecting Laurie Oakes to sort of have a concoction of the Rudd gaff on tax and some of the, um, uh, the by-play, the, uh, the exchange in relation to the remarks made by the Chief of Staff of the uh, Special Minister of State. I thought, I thought that would be the Oakes package. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I hope that we, you know, I hope there's more of Rudd you know, I'll be honest about it. I hope there's more of Rudd's mistake uh, than there is about the other issue. And I think you'd understand why I would say that. And then quite out of the blue, we have this astonishing thing, uh, this reference to the Leader of the Opposition's health. Now, Mr Speaker, why did... Why, now, isn't that interesting? With an exclusive... Uh, with an exclusive, Mr Speaker. Isn't that coincidental? I mean, as the, as the Treasurer rightly said, why on earth, Mr Speaker, why on earth would we fight our own story? Now, you know, if I were a suspicious person, and I'm not, Mr Speaker, I think, you know, charitably towards the Leader of the Opposition in relation to these matters, Mr Speaker, if I were a suspicious person, I would say to myself, well, I don't think that story's come from our side of politics. I think that story may have come from another side of politics, Mr Speaker. And, you know, but I am, you know, I'm not normally a suspicious person. But I may well have thought that, Mr Speaker, but let me, let me just take this opportunity of saying we are not interested in smearing the Leader of the Opposition as an individual. We never have been, Mr Speaker. What the, what the Labor Party has endeavoured to do, what the, what the Labor Party has endeavoured to do all of this year is to construct in the minds of the Australian people the belief that any attack on the Leader of the Opposition is a personal smear of the Leader of the Opposition, that you are not allowed to criticise the Leader of the Opposition. He's the one political leader in Australian history who is not 
We are not entitled to question. We're not entitled to attack. The member, he Jelly Brain. Coming out in the press, and he says there's going to be a mother of all fear campaigns, Mr. Speaker. I can tell the Leader of the Opposition that we will be telling the Australian people when the election campaign starts of the danger of electing a union dominated government. We will be telling the Australian people, Mr. Speaker, of the danger to good government in this country of having a Labor government federally as well as a Labor government in power in each of the states and the territories. We the will be telling is the Australian people that it is not a good thing to place the management of the Australian economy in the hands of inexperienced people who don't, for example, understand our taxation system at a time when international storm clouds are threatening Mr. Speaker, uh, threatening the stability of the international economy. Mr. Speaker. This, more than at any time over the last five years, is a time for the Australian economy to be in strong, experienced hands, in the hands of people who understand how to withstand the ravages of international economic buffeting. Mr. Speaker. Now, the Leader of the Opposition would say to the Australian people, Oh, they can't say that about me. It's a smear, Mr. Speaker. Can I remind the Leader of the Opposition that he's only been in politics since 1998? A number of us have been in politics for a long time. And if, if he Order. imagines that what has been said about his lack of experience, what has been said about his um, knowledge deficit in relation to taxation, that what has been said about his glass jaw, that that represents a personal attack and a personal smear. Can I say to the Leader of the Opposition, through you, you haven't the been born, Melbourne is on Mr. very thin ice. Because I, I remember the day my predecessor pointed at Alexander Down, and I've never forgotten it, and accused his father of being part of the appeasement brigade in the late 1930s and called, you know, called into question the courage of a man who spent four years as a prisoner of war of the Japanese on the, the member, Burma Jelly Thailand Railway, and, and yet the Labor Party sat there and they were perfectly happy to have that. I can, I can remember the Leader of the Opposition jumping up when his, uh, his uh, predecessor, but one Mark Latham, used one of the most vulgar expressions I've ever heard used in this parliament about a female journalist, Mr Speaker, and we all know what I'm referring to, and I remember the deafening silence of the Leader of the Opposition, right. and I remember the deafening silence of all the female members of the Australian Labor Party, Mr Speaker. Not one Order. of them got up to members defend, on my right. not one of them got up to condemn that foul insinuation about Janet Albrechtson, Mr Speaker. And I also of course remember the deafening silence of the Leader of the Opposition when Mark Latham referred to Tony Staley's physical disability occasioned by a motor car accident that Order. almost claimed his life, Mr Speaker, and Tony's life hung in the balance for 12 months. And to this the member day, for Kingsford Smith is warned. With the benefit only of crutches and yet not a silence. The Leader of the Opposition thinks he's been smeared because people dare to criticise his policies. He hasn't been born in Australian politics, Mr Speaker, to understand that. I regard the attempt by the Labor Party to, to implicate us in this smear as, as, as a piece of, of it's a base diversion, and the Leader of the Opposition has utterly failed to produce any evidence to support his claim. You, and what's more, he was too gutless to ask the question himself, Mr Speaker. He should have got up. He should have got up. And at the first Order. instance, he didn't have the courage the to do that, Mr. Speaker, and he stands condemned as a expired. result. Yeah. The time, order. The time for the extension of the debate has now expired. The original question was that the motion be agreed to, to which the honourable the leader of the opposition has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted, with a view to substituting other words. The immediate question is that the words proposed be omitted to stand part of the question. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the words proposed to be admitted stand part of the question. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point the honourable members for Corangamite and Riverina tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Melbourne Ports and Shortland tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 81, noes 52. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion for suspension of standing orders moved by the Treasurer be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. One of the interesting things about the debate in the chamber this afternoon is that the Prime Minister has just required a Prime Ministerial protection order from interventions. If this was a serious debate about matters before the House and matters before the nation, why is that particular procedural device necessary to protect the Prime Minister from the indignity of points of order? I find it extraordinary that uh, the Leader of the House would seek to protect the Prime Minister in such a fashion rather than allow the Prime Minister to fend for himself, as other members of this chamber are required to do. Mr Speaker, the motion before us asks why these questions have been put to the Parliament today. The answer, Mr Speaker, is that the function of the Parliament is to, provide, is to provide the executive with the opportunity to answer questions put to it by the opposition. And these are matters which therefore demand answers. What we've had from those opposite today is a sense of continued feigned indignation, as if any negative smear campaign has been mysteriously pulled out of space with which those opposite have had nothing whatsoever to do. No awareness whatsoever on the part of the Prime Minister or on the part of anybody else. But look carefully also at the Prime Minister's responses to the questions which are asked. I, the Prime Minister, have no awareness of any such activity. I am not responsible for it, and I am, quote, not aware of others in the Liberal Party and the government. 
Prime Minister, we have heard that through children overboard. We have heard that through the Wheat for Weapons scandal. We have heard it time in and time out as you have sought to avoid accountability in this parliament. Leader of the Opposition. Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the House on a point of order. Mr. Speaker. Order. Leader Mr. of the House on a point of order. Mr. Speaker. Mr. The member for Jellybrand has been warned. The, 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 motion. the member for Jellybrand has been warned and she'll. The motion that the, the House leader has of the passed House. requires the Leader of the Opposition to detail to the House his no smear allegations order. against the no, Prime Minister. No point of order. He, he, he needs to speak no to the No point of order. No point of order. Leader of the, uh, leader of the Opposition. Thank you, I warn members there are a number of been warned and I will not give them another warning. You should know that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I find it interesting also that apart from the Prime Ministerial Protection Order issued by the Manager of Government Business, the Prime Minister has cut and run from the Chamber altogether on these matters. I find it remarkable that a Government of Courage, a Prime Minister of Courage, has to hide behind such procedural devices to avoid accountability. There's a big problem, Mr Deputy Speaker, with the argument advanced by the Prime Minister today. The Prime Minister's conspiracy theory runs along these lines. That after a press conference I conducted at Queanbeyan yesterday, I came back into this chamber and organised through my office an exclusive interview with Laurie Oakes. The That's the proposition. Up. Prime Minister just put that. There is a little problem with that conspiracy theory because Laurie Oakes came and saw me yesterday before, morning before I went anywhere near Queanbeyan. Laurie Oakes, Laurie Oakes came to my office to put these particular matters which had been put to him. So the Prime Ministerial conspiracy theory is we have a press conference out at Queenbeyan, a press conference out at Queenbeyan, also put by this man who lacks the courage ever to become Prime Minister, only courage, courage enough to whisper innuendo about his Prime Minister when the Prime Minister isn't here. What we have here is the Prime Minister advancing a conspiracy theory which collapses in a heap. The journalist in Member question, Laurie Oakes, one of the most respected figures in the gallery, came to me yesterday morning before we went anywhere near Queanbeyan, put to me the specific propositions. The conspiracy theory collapses in a heap. Second point is this, that other media outlets late in the day also, contacted by my office, confirmed that the same story was being shopped around. A remarkable coincidence, it seems. And again, we have the, the uh, manager the of government business refusing. The leader of the house on a point of order. Of order, Mr. Speaker. Uh, is he saying that Laurie Oakes said the, the government point? said this? Order. Order. What is the point of order? Point of I order, couldn't hear it. The point, the point of order is relevant to the would motion. Be quiet, I might uh, hear is it. the Leader of the Opposition saying that Laurie Oakes That's claimed the government gave him this evidence? Not a point of order. The Leader of the Opposition. The member for Swan. The member. That the where are Two other media outlets, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Two other media outlets confirmed subsequently that this story had been shopped to them in recent days. Furthermore, we the were advised the that this story had come forward from a source hostile to the Labor Party. <laughs> furthermore, furthermore, the contents. Furthermore, furthermore, the contents, the contents of the story ran along these lines. It contained the date of the medical procedure, which I had. It had also the details of the doctor who supposedly performed the procedure, though the name of the doctor was not given to me. And furthermore, there was a further view put that um, the source had said that uh, the durability of the aortic valve use in the replacement surgery had a finite duration, would last 10 years, and that therefore my health was in some peril. This was not put to one media outlet. It was put to, we have at least confirmed, three media outlets. Therefore, the question is this, and Prime Minister, you're absent from that. The approach from Laurie Oakes came before I went anywhere near Queanbeyan yesterday. Your entire conspiracy theory collapsed in a heap while you're absent from the chamber. Years ago, and this matter has been raised, I think, by someone opposite, in an interview, I think, on Channel 7, were asked about organ donations. I said I supported organ donations because I'd been the beneficiary of one. Furthermore, furthermore, in private conversations with cardiac patients various times who have sought some counsel and support, I've provided whatever counsel and support that I could. But on top of that, can I say this? The three sets of information which these journalists put to me yesterday 
have never ever been put into the public domain. Never ever been put into the public domain. And so we were therefore put in a position where I had to respond to the matters which had been put. The reason why the question was put in this House today is the job of the parliament is to get an answer back from the executive as to whether these things are true, but it doesn't stop there, Mr Deputy Speaker. The question is asked, particularly by the manager of government business, as to why we could possibly suspect that the government may be involved in anything untoward. Anything untoward. Here we have Sunday Telegraph, 29 August 2007. Dig and you will find dirt, article by Simon Benson. And it involves an interview involving a radio host, Bill Shorten and Tony Habit. Bill Shorten says, and this is only last month, Tony, are you saying you don't have a dirt unit and it doesn't have people trying to scour up the backgrounds of Labor candidates? Answer Tony Abbott, of course, of course. Of, I am reading a transcript. Of course, obviously you, order, want, order, order, obviously order. you want to look at the files and all that kind of stuff. That is the question which was put to him by Bill Shorten in that interview, and that was the manager of government business's response. That's the transcript. And so you ask with this feigned innocence and indignation as to why we in the opposition might dare suspect that you guys might be up to no good. Well, I think there's a reasonable basis for looking at that. Furthermore, when you look at the other matters which have been put into the public debate on all of this, the other matter which was canvassed today into question goes to the report by Hedley Thomas in The Australian. And the report by Hedley Thomas is quite explicit. Liberal Party figures in Queensland, including a forensic accountant, have been examining the purchase and the links between the vendors, referring to myself and my, uh, referring to the purchase of a house by my wife and myself, and the Labor Party's investment companies for several months. If that's in the public record, and that's there from Hedley Thomas, who is a long-standing journalist with News Limited, it is equally legitimate to put this matter for the government to seek a response to. But on top of that. Is the government saying that Jason Katsoukas lies through his teeth? This is the term of art now used by those opposite, because Jason Katsoukas only a couple of weeks ago or less details precisely his visit to a ministerial suite to be handed, to be handed a file which has Gillard on the top and it deals explicitly with a whole series of allegations concerning the deputy leader of the opposition. And you sit there opposite believing you are purer than the driven snow. It is remarkable the feigned indignation about these questions, including from Captain Courageous over there, the would-be Prime Minister, without any intestinal fortitude whatsoever to ever stand up to the plate and say, I would like to be Prime Minister, I'd like to have the guts to challenge the Prime Minister, but oops, I'll step back from the plate again. Always privately, always privately, lacking courage, lacking conviction, always whispering behind people's back, but never with the fortitude the conviction to stand up to the plate and actually challenge the government's leader, the leader of the Liberal Party, for his job. Order, order. Being 4.30 p.m., PM I am obliged to put the question that the House do now adjourn. The, the leader of the House. I require that the question be put forthwith. The question is uh, the House now adjourn. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Then we have, then we have the question which concerns also the uh, activities of those in the government dirt unit, which we've already, we have already referred to in detail concerning Mr. Phelps, the Chief of Staff of the, of the uh, Minister, Special Minister of State. The truth of these propositions, and I've only been through three of them, the Katsukas article, the Headley Thomas article, the confession by Tony Abbott in the Sunday Telegraph, order, as, as order, well as order, all these related order, matters, point order, to the fact order, that these the matters should be the answered the by the Resume manager of government The Leader of the Opposition was Jimmy Seat. The Honourable Leader of the House. Mr. Speaker, I know this is a debate, but he's not entitled to misrepresent me like that. It is a blatant, deliberate misrepresentation, order, 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 and, the, and Dietrich the Bonhoeffer the, shouldn't do the leader it. Leader of the House was Jimmy Seat. That is not a point of order. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr Speaker. In terms of misrepresentation about the existence of a dirt unit, it is extraordinary that the manager of government business could stand in the chamber and say it doesn't exist when out of his own mouth he says that it does. The question put to him by Bill Shorten is, Tony, are you saying you don't have a dirt unit and it doesn't have people trying to scour up the backgrounds of Labor candidates? Tony Abbott, of course. 
Of course. Obviously, you want to look at the files and all that kind of stuff. Order. What, Order. What happens? Order. What happens here? What happens here is, of course, is of course the manager of government business is hoisted by his own petard, hung out of the words that have proceeded from his own mouth, confirming less than a month ago on Melbourne Radio, I presume, that in fact that in fact this dirt unit does exist and engages in that sort of activity. The feigned indignation also becomes much wider than that. Let us remember a certain individual called Senator Heppinen. The Prime Minister has made reference to all these indignations in the past. Well, Prime Minister, your responsibility when it comes to either backing or overturning remarks by Senator Heppinen. What did Senator Heffernan have to say about the Deputy Leader of the Opposition? And what did you say in response to that immediately? But look, I'm not telling people what they should apologise for or not. I'm just stating my own view. So, in other words, when that foul language was used by Senator Heffernan in relation to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, what the Prime Minister sought to do was quickly sidestep to one side. Nothing to do with me. It's old Bill there running off the tracks. I don't have anything to do with that. But then what happens? The heat gets too much, the political reaction around the country gets too solid, and suddenly the Prime Minister then has to change his tune later on. The reason, Mr Speaker, that we moved an amendment earlier on, which the government wasn't prepared to take, is that all these questions, all these questions go to the absolute heart of the integrity of the operations of this government. Oh yes, it does, Prime Minister. It goes to the whole question of a government grown arrogant grown out of touch Order. after 11 long years Order. in office. A government, which is now, my right. a government which has now sought to use all the instruments available to it in terms of the public servants which work for it, in terms of its own ministerial staff, in terms of the rot and abuse of taxpayer-funded advertising. Order. The, in terms Order. Of the Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Hon. The Treasurer. Speaker, the the uh, standing and sessional orders have been suspended to allow the Leader of the Opposition to detail to the House his smear allegation against the Prime Minister, the Liberal Party and the Government. And I would ask you to bring him back to detail the smear allegations that he makes against the Prime Minister, the Liberal Party and the Government. The Leader of the Opposition, I am sure, has heard that point of order and I would ask him to Come back to the question, debate. question of the glass jaw of the Treasurer and his inability, his inability to respond to the matters which have been raised, it stands for the entire chamber to hear. We have been through point by point each of the matters, each of the matters which have required answers by the government opposite. And why is there this feigned indignation from those opposite? Because they don't want to answer the questions. They don't want to answer whose ministerial suite was it that Someone had to provide a dirt file on in relation to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Whose was it? Have you bothered to check that out? Who is the forensic accountant referred to over here in the other article? Have you bothered to check that out? Have you, have you bothered also, has the government also bothered to ascertain precisely what has happened with Tony order, Abbott's order, order. The Leader of the Opposition was me seat. The Treasurer. Standing and special orders have been suspended to allow the Leader of the Opposition to detail the smear allegations to the House, Order. I would ask that you bring him back to detailing those allegations. Order. The point that the of order that the point of order raised by the Treasurer is a valid point of order. The leader has been asked, leader of the opposition has been asked to uh, provide evidence. Uh, and the leader of the opposition will come back to the motion. On the question of the um, on the question of the Laurie Oaks matter before, and you're out of the chamber. You're out of the chamber for this Prime Minister. Let me put it before you pure and simple. Your contention here in this place was that a conspiracy had been engaged in by myself with a journalist. To do, a, to do an exclusive interview subsequent to a press conference at Queanbeyan yesterday, and your conspiracy collapsed into a heap. You know why, Prime Minister? Because Laurie Oakes came to see me before I went anywhere near Queanbeyan. Anywhere near Queanbeyan. Three journalists came to us with the pieces of information that I referred to before, and we were also informed that these sources came from those hostile to the Labor Party. The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Minister for Immigra Immigration and Citizenship. On a point of order, Mr. Speaker, going to the 
wording of the motion, can we ask the Leader of the Opposition to give us just one piece of evidence? The just one piece. Seat. The Minister resume his seat. And as I hear it, I believe the Leader of the Opposition is in order. But Thank you very before much, I Mr. call Speaker. the Leader of the Opposition, I would ask him to desist using the words you and your. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. So each of those uh, reports to us by the media caused us to conclude, given the nature of the information, that legitimate questions need to be posed. And what is remarkable here, Order. what is remarkable Order. here, Members is on the my feigned right. indignation, the feigned Members indignation, on my right. the feigned indignation from those opposite, the feigned indignation from those opposite about where the this material came House. from. It would have been very simple and straightforward for an unequivocal statement to be made about Order. these matters, and it was not. The Leader of the Opposition on resume his seat. The I will warn other members if they continue to interject like that. The Leader of the House. Mr. Speaker, the point of order is relevance. Did Laurie Oakes say the government gave him the information? The order. I say to the Leader of the House, the Leader of the Opposition is in order and he has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I notice again that the uh, Leader of the House does not seek to extend the same sort of procedural protection for the likes of me as he sought to extend to the Prime Minister and did so successfully. Once again, a series of interruptions as the response provided by myself is delivered. Prime Minister, the country actually wants to have a debate about plans for the future. And you know something, you know something, Prime Minister. Order. You extended that opportunity in the Parliament the today, and you declined. The nation wants to know what your plans are for the future of the education system, because the there is nothing Bass there. Is they want to know what your plans are for the future of 750 public hospitals in the country, and they are not there. They want to know what your plans are for the future of broadband, Order. Order. and they are not the there. Leader, leader of the opposition, Jimmy. The Treasurer, uh, I the Treasurer standing, on a point of order. Standing and special sessional orders have been suspended to allow the Leader of the Opposition to detail his smear allegation against the government. I ask that you bring him back to that. Uh, treasurer, Jimmy, to that. The Treasurer raised a valid point of order, and I say to the Leader of the Opposition, if that point of order is raised, it has to be alluded to again, then he will have to resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition. On the question of our allegation against this government, Mr. Speaker, I conclude with this: that this government stands condemned for having lost touch, for a government which has no positive plans for the future, and a government instead determined to wage an unrelenting negative smear campaign against the opposition from here until election day, an election day which Captain Arrogance over there has already announced on behalf of his Prime Minister. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Be placed on the notice paper. I thank the Prime Minister. Yeah.